morning, Hope Point Church. It's delightful to see you. Whether you're in the room or online, we are glad you are here. Indeed. Here's what's coming up in the life of our church over the next couple of months or so. Our Christmas setup is uh, approaching fast this month, the 22nd of November. That is a Tuesday. Uh, we're inviting anyone and anyone who can help. We're going to be here from 10. Some people are going to be here from 10 all the way until the evening to set up our property. Uh, for our amazing Christmas season. So if you're able to help, we would love you to come down and help. Whatever you can do, we will have jobs for you. Mm. Put your name down at the info desk, sign up 22nd of November. That is a Tuesday Christmas set. EJ, you know what you can take to the bank? Uh, money? The women of High Point Church, you're going on uh, your Christmas party on the 24th of November. That is a Thursday. Uh, at it's night. only yes at, at night, night. It's at a night. dinner. Uh, it's only available for children over age fifteen uh, oh. due to the seating arrangements. Um, but get along Thursday, the twenty fourth of November at the bank, the women's Christmas party. Sign up at the info desk. Our Christmas weekend is fast approaching because it's pretty much the same time every year. This uh, December, the tenth and the eleventh, would you say Saturday? And a Sunday at night, we are doing our big Christmas event to reach um, our community, our families, um, those who don't know Jesus to hear the good news about the gospel and to celebrate this Christmas season. So put that in your diaries if you haven't already. If it's in your diary, go put it in your calendar. Go put it in your friend's calendar. The 10th and the 11th, Saturday and Sunday night. Um, be there, uh, see how you can invite a friend or even if you can volunteer, please head to the info desk and put your name down. Seniors, you are having a little get together at the Tabar's place wow. on the 12th of November. 12th of November, if I look at my watch, Saturday. that would be a Saturday. It it's at 5 p.m. So seniors, get along. Uh, see your leaders for more information. See the info desk for more information. But mm. Seniors get together on the 12th of November at the Tabar's, 5 p.m. On the 25th of November, we have our Playtime Christmas party from 10 till 12. I don't know what that was, but we are looking for people who can come and help us put this on we've been so thankful to those who already have come and help us launch playtime back uh halfway through this year we're so grateful to have this ministry back but if you can help out on the 25th of november from 10 a.m till 12 p.m please head to the info desk put your name down or go and find becky um and just sign up and help out as we have a christmas party and have our last playtime for the year November 25th, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Well, Hope Point Church, you're done with us. We can leave now. True. We're glad you're here. Why don't you stand up? We're going to praise God together. Uh, remember, worship changes the atmosphere in your life and in the room. We love you. Have a great week. See you next time. Good morning, church. Let's get ready to praise him together.
So you know that we've been in a series, a Psalm series from Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, it says this, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Amen. What good news. We're going to sing Nowhere to Run. Here we go. Nowhere to run, Lord. Nowhere to
you're never gonna let me down and you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down. come on we sing you're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down you're Just lift up the name of Jesus this morning. Whether you're in the room, whether you're watching online this morning, we lift up the name of Jesus. We glorify you. We exalt you. There's no one like you, Jesus. No one like you, Jesus. The writer of the Hebrews tells us that as we go through life, from start to finish, keep your eyes on Jesus. We live in a world where it's very easy for us to be sidetracked. You could even be here this morning and your mind's a thousand miles away. It's just keep your mind on Jesus from start to finish. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He won't let you down. He will lead you through. It's Jesus. And the writer to the Hebrews says later on, he talks about Jesus being our priest. The one who intercedes for us. The one who comes for us. It says there were many Levitical priests, but there had to be many because they, they kept dying. They would all die off. But this priest, Jesus, he lives forever. He lives forever and ever and ever. And it says this Jesus that we're keeping our eyes on, our priest, he says he's able to save Matter of fact, it says he's able to more than save to the uttermost those who come to him through God, those who come to God through him. Jesus is able to save you. So at times he'll lift you out of situations. Other times he'll be with you and he'll walk you through the situation. But it says this Jesus that we're keeping our eyes on, this one who reigns, this one who is our refuge, our strength, our fortress, our lover, this Jesus this Jesus is able to save. He's writing to believers. And then he says, you know why? Because he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's praying to you this morning. Before you got out of bed, he's praying for you. He, he ever lives to make intercession for us. And so he says, just keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him. Encourage one another. Keep your eyes on him. Hang on to Jesus. Because there's many things that come and try and knock us out the road. But this Jesus, the priest who lives forever, he's able, he's more than able for all his kids that are with us this morning. This Jesus is able to save you, to help you, to lead you, to guide you. He says, it's actually, he's more than able. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. Not just the grown-ups, for the kids here today. He prays for you. He prays for you. Let's just lift our hands before him. We're going to sing that hallelujah. Our God reigns. Jesus, we give you thanks this morning. As we worship you, as we come to open your word in a minute, and you're going to reveal even more of who you are this morning to us, we come to give you praise. 
We, with open hands, we lift them before you. We surrender to you. We acknowledge without you, we can do nothing. That's why you told us to keep our eyes on you. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. You're a, you're a priest that lives forever, that prays for us. And so, Lord, this morning, and for those who may be online today, we just, we just surrender to you. We lift our hands and our hearts to you. And we declare that you reign forever, that you're in control, that you are God, that there is no one like you. There is no one like you. Let's lift our voice this morning. Hallelujah. It's great that you have friends and we have friends that pray for us and there's people that we had to pray for. But Jesus prays for us. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us as we just follow Him and trust Him this morning. If you're joining us online on your screen, will be ways that you can give this morning. There are buckets there for those in the room. We're just going to greet one another a second as our kids go out and our kids' workers are already lined up at the back. Let's just pray for our kids this morning. It's not big church and little church. There's only one church. Remember Remember that when the mothers brought their children to Jesus, the disciples shoot them away as if they were unimportant. But Jesus said, unless you become like a little child. So we pray for our kids today, Lord. We pray for those who maybe not be here due to sickness and watching online this morning. We pray for them. We pray for your plans and purposes over them. We pray they would have an encounter with you, ongoing encounters, that they will know you, Jesus, more than just from a textbook or from whatever they read, but they will know you personally. We speak blessing over them, over our kids' workers today. In Jesus' name, amen. And we thank you that you are our God. You're our supplier. You're our sufficiency. Everything we have comes from you. Why don't you look for someone this morning? You can say hello to as our kids go out and then Pastor Beck's going to come. Well, good morning. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, George.
you know, a burglar. Did I say it right, Caleb? Because I was corrected in the car. Burglar. Is that fine? Okay. A burglar broke into a house one night and he shone his flashlight around <clears throat> looking for valuables. And when he picked up a CD player and some other things, he put it in his sack and a strange disembodied voice echoed from the dark saying, Jesus is watching you. And he nearly jumped out of his skin. He clicked off his torch and he froze. And when he heard nothing more after a bit, he shook his head and promised himself a vacation after the next big score. And then he clicked the light back on and began searching more valuables. And just as he pulled the stereo out so he could disconnect the wires, clear as a bell, he heard, Jesus is watching you. Totally rattled, he shone the light from the torch around frantically looking for the source of the voice. And finally, in the corner of a room, the flashlight beam came to rest on a parrot. Did you say that? He hissed to the parrot. Yes, the parrot confessed and then squawked. I'm just trying to warn you, the burglar relaxed. Warn me, huh? Who do you think you are anyway? Moses, replied the bird. <laughs> Moses, the burglar replied. What kind of stupid people would name a bird Moses? And the bird promptly answered, the same kind of people that would name a Rottweiler Jesus. The Rottweiler was sitting there waiting to pounce. Get it? His name was Jesus. Okay, okay. You get it? Okay, it's sinking in. Anyway, the kids in the car were like, I don't get it. That's just... Christian laughed in the front, so I figured I was okay for most of you. This morning, we are continuing on our second week in the series of Psalm 139. Would you get your Bibles out? We're going to read in the NIV this morning. You might want to... Find it on your phone. Uh, this is my favorite psalm, Psalm 139. Actually, we have a bit of a tradition in our family that everyone has their own psalm. And um, it started with um, my grandmother, or probably before that. But, um, and the way it works in our family is that you each get a psalm, you, and you borrow your mother's psalm or your father's psalm until God reveals a psalm to yourself and that becomes your psalm. So for most of my life, Psalm 91, which was my mom's psalm, was my psalm that I held on to, clung to, loved it, chewed on it, all of the above. And then I remember going to Year 7 camp. I was at a Christian school. Um, anyone remember Year 7 camp? Or you've blocked it out of your memory, maybe. Went to Year 7 camp and I remember... Um, they did an activity where all the kids kind of went off in, to different locations and, you know, as a Christian school, spent time with Jesus. And it was before phones, before everyone was mucking around on their phones. And so all you had was a Bible. And, um, and I remember opening up to Psalm 139 and being absolutely gobsmacked. Lord, you search me and you know me? You know when I sit, like, you know God that I'm sitting on this grass right now, you know it. You know when I rise, like you care about the details so much that when I sit down and when I get up, you're paying attention. Are you kidding me? Lord, you search me and you know me, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, oh Lord, you know it all together. And as a talker, that, will, that is the scariest verse in the Bible that before a word enters your tongue, he already knows it. I mean, the all-knowing of God, the fact that he knows all about me, and the thing that blows my mind is he knows all about me and he loves me completely. It's not even that he knows me, it's that he knows me and he loves me. He factored in every mistake that I would ever make before he chose me and said, I love you. He factored in every time I would mess up, I would say a conversation wrong, I would do the wrong thing, I would, he, he factored it all in and said, I love you. I mean, is this an amazing God that we serve? Have a look at this. It says, you discern my going out, verse three, and my lying down, you're familiar with all my ways, verse four, before a word is on my tongue, you know it, Lord, completely. You hem me in, Behind and before, you lay your hand 
upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And that's where we got to last week. This morning, we're going to look at one question, and it's, where is God? Have you ever had that question where uh, someone comes and asks you, where is God? Well, where is he anyway? You know, there was a little boy uh, on a plane, and he was sitting next to a theologian, and the theologian, <clears throat> the, the, um, theologian said to him, well, where is God? Expecting him to say, he's in my heart. Or... And the little boy turned to him, Oh, and he said, I'll give, you, I'll give you an apple if you can tell me where God is. And the little boy turned to him and said, I'll give you a bunch of apples if you can tell me where God isn't. <laughs> and I want you to look this morning at this God who is ever-present and all-knowing and all-loving and just take a fresh look and be gobsmacked and in awe like you were as a kid or when the first time you knew him. Like just take a fresh glance at this all-knowing God. You know, Psalm 139, this is not a theological article as much as it is a song of revelation that David put into song. Can you use it theologically? Absolutely, but it wasn't David's intent and purposes. purpose. He was writing a love song to his God that would be used... Uh, in the church, in the temple, be used for praise. He's writing, that's the context. It'd be like you sitting down and deciding, I'm gonna write a psalm this afternoon of all, all my love for God, and you sit down and you begin to write. This is David's psalm. This is the melody of his heart to his God. So question, because he's gonna go on to say, you know when I sin, when I rise, you know everything. When was the last time we just sat down and thanked God for who he is? Nothing about what he's done personally for us. But the intricate bits and pieces of the things that he does in our everyday life. Just some random information, because you know I love this stuff. In this psalm, there are four stages, and there are six stanzas in the psalm, and each time we will, um, the psalmist will unravel an attribute of God that only God has. Uh, in Latin, they use the word um, omni, which is all. And then the theologians, of course, just to complicate everything that could be simple, instead of just saying all present, they will say omnipresent, which means all present. And instead of saying um, all knowing, they will say omniscient. You've heard all these omni, omni, you go, what's the omni? Omni is just all. But God, this psalm will reveal that he is omniscient. He's all-knowing. You think science, like all the stuff. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere present. And then he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. We don't have a hard time, I think, thinking about that God knows everything. I mean, Google knows everything. Like, if we can create technology that can, I mean, they may get it wrong sometimes, but if, if we can create technology that can know the answers, it's probably not too far from our thinking. I mean, you know some really bright people. It's not far-fetching that people would know a lot. It's not even, we know some powerful people, people who have strength and they push through or maybe physical power. So even in our heads, it's not probably they're all powerful. But to think that someone could be everywhere ever present all the time should blow our minds to the point that we probably shouldn't fully understand it. Okay, now that we've established what we won't understand, let's work out what we will. Notice that when you get into those verse, verse six verses, David will use the word you. Have a look, verse one, you have searched me, Lord. Verse two, you know when I sit. Verse three, you discern my going out and my lying down. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it all completely. Verse five, you hem me in behind and before, laid your hand upon me. And then he's gonna get, this is too much. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. If you looked at this in the original Hebrew, in the ancient Hebrew, that word you is almost like magnified. You, you. You, the, notice the emphasis is not even necessarily on the end of the sentence. The, the emphasis is on what he brings, and it's him. It's not just all God knows in verse 1 to 6, but it's all God knows about me. 
He makes it personal. He brings it down to where it is. And it's interesting because if you look at this psalm, you can think of the word surround. The verse six, first six verses, his knowledge surrounds me. Some of you, just this alone is going to like, oh. The first six verses, his knowledge surrounds me. Verse seven to 12, his, if we have it there, we're surrounded by his presence. His presence surrounds me. If you look at the next, 13 to, I think it's 18, you're surrounded by his power, his omnipotence. So we're surrounded by his knowledge, surrounded by his presence, surrounded by his power. Have a look. We sang it this morning so beautifully. Thanks to the worship team for learning that song this morning. Verse 7, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? And where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the morning, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. This is hard to understand. Timothy Keller says this, he says, all of God is everywhere and present in every point in time and space. And the example that he gives, which is great, he says, if I had a, if I had a bottle of gas here this morning and I opened the gas, the gas would fill the room. He talks about how um, the molecules would extend. That is not what we're talking about. When you talk about the omnipresence of God, all of God is everywhere. He doesn't give like a little portion of himself to George and then a little portion of himself to Gary and a little portion of himself to John. He gives all of himself to all of us. You know, sometimes we'll read in the scriptures that God's presence was localized, that God's presence uh, was with, as they were leaving Egypt and they walked in the wilderness, there was a what was there? A pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, a sign that the presence of God was with them. You know, when Solomon, Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory filled the temple, and yet Solomon would pray this prayer. He says, but will God indeed dwell with people on earth? How much less this temple? In other words, buildings cannot contain our God. I mean, let's switch to the New Testament where we learn that you and I are the temple. You and I are the, are the temple of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us where you are, God is. God is in us. God dwells within us, His presence with us. Romans 8, 38 to 39, if you have your Bibles, would you turn there? I want to give you some scriptures that parallel this. It says, verse 38, or verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then Paul says this, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Have a look at this. Where can I go? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? The, um, the writer is not saying, I don't know. His answer is nowhere. But if we were honest, how many times do you wonder, well, where's God in all this? And I want to pose this thought that maybe he's there and you're just not looking. Maybe he's there and it's just become so familiar that you don't recognize his presence. Maybe. That God with us, the promise that Jesus made to never leave us, never forsake us, that he would be with us. What do you say? Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. 
David Livingston, when he retired, went back to England. He was in front of Queen Victoria and uh, they were asking David Livingston, the famous missionary to Africa, what's your secret? You know, how, you know, what's the longevity? And he said, I'll give you one reason why I was able to face the things I did. And he said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When you have a revelation that God is with you, then Goliath looks like today's work and not today's battle. When you know that God is with you, then what seems impossible becomes possible because the God who is all-knowing and all-present and all-powerful is with you. Imagine if you went into a test and you had the teacher with you. Are you going to worry about the test? The teacher is right with you. Uh, Excuse me, can you help me with the answer? You have ever present with you, the all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God, and we don't recognize that He's with us. We've become so familiar, so familiar with His presence. Where is God? And He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? You know, in... um, If you look in the book of Jonah, Jonah decided that he would flee from God's spirit. It actually, if you look in the book of Jonah, it's the the same words that the psalmist used about fleeing from your presence. And Jonah, what would Jonah do? Oh, that's not Jeremiah 23, but that's okay. They're two separate, but that's okay. When Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord, he was you know, in rebellion. He was like, I don't want to go and preach to those Ninevites. I'm part scared at them, part annoyed with them. Do you know the history, God? You know, they, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. And he's like, I am running away. And what would happen? He couldn't even get on a boat with a bunch of misfits in the middle of the ocean without God showing up And then God would send a fish. I mean, one of my favorite parts of Jonah where it says, and the Lord sent a fish. And I love that all of a sudden, Jonah is in the belly of this fish. I mean, sometimes when everything stinks around you, just maybe God sent it. Just maybe. And all of a sudden, he's in this situation where he's in the belly of a fish because he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He got this revelation right there in the middle of that ocean. And some of you have had this revelation right in the middle of circumstances that you have. There is nowhere I can go. There is nowhere I can go to flee his presence. And some of us have tried. Some of us have tried to flee from his presence into addiction. Some of us have tried to flee from his presence into, you name it. Some of us have tried to flee from his presence into the crowd. But there wasn't anywhere that Jonah could flee from his presence. And it's the same word the psalmist says here. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If you look at, and we will, we'll look at Jeremiah 23, 23, 24. God answers the question. Jeremiah 23, 23 to 24. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. This is his very own words. I'm everywhere. Heaven, earth, there's no secret place you can go. There's no hiding place. I'm far, I'm near, there is nowhere I can go. Now, I think for some of us, it's, that's a comfort. Oh, yes, there's nowhere I can go from God's presence. Others of us, all of a sudden we're thinking about the places we've gone, the things we do, and the thought that we took God there. He doesn't dwell in buildings anymore. He dwells with people. Scripture says that he's with you. God is with us. 
It's interesting here when you look at it. It says, if I go up to the heavens, verse 8, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. That word for depths is Sheol or grave. So if I make my bed in the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. David's going to use polarity like polar opposites now to prove. It doesn't matter where we go. East, west, he's there. If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the morning, you're there. If I settle on the far side of the sea. He's using this parallel. You know, there was an ancient belief system that when a person was buried, they were cut off from God. That when you died, God was nowhere. And David was saying, even before Jesus, he's having this revelation that God is everywhere. He's saying, no way, God is on the other side of death. You know, the scripture says that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And for a believer, death is a homecoming. I fully believe that my mom is alive in Christ. I fully believe that she is more alive today than I can imagine. But her address has changed. And for that, I'm mad. <laughs> but her, adge- her address has changed. She has moved location. But she is very much alive in Christ, according to 1 Thessalonians. And so getting this revelation that wherever we go, the heavens or the depths, he's there. You know, um, in Mark chapter 5, Jesus was brought into a room of a little girl who was dead. And he says, Talitha kum, he says, little one, awake. And it's the, thought, the sort of thing Jesus is saying there. He actually took her hand and he says, Talitha kum. And the sort of thing he's saying there is the thought of thing that you would say to a sleeping child. Basically saying, sweetheart, wake up. Is it like that in your house in the mornings? It's not like that in my house. Get up out of bed. We've got 20 minutes. Move it. I'm sure that the green child in my house would love me to go, wake up, Ella, it's fine. Anyway, it's not... But Jesus grabs this little girl who they think is dead by the hand and says, sweetheart, wake up. Death, the most deadly foe. Listen, listen. He reaches in to death and pulls her through to life, even there. Isn't that what he does to you and I when when that moment of death for a believer happens that he reaches and says, oh, the grave can't contain you. And he reaches and he pulls us through into eternal life and resurrection life. What a beautiful picture. Distance cannot hide us from God. You can't go anywhere in the world to escape him. Interesting where that phrase where it says, uh, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, literally it's talking about the raising of the morning sun. And in the Middle East, the utter east is where the sun is coming up. So it's literally the psalmist is saying, if I traveled on the horizon... You are there. And then he says, and if I settle on the far side of the sea and in, think about it, if you're in Israel, the Mediterranean is to the west. So what's he saying? From east to west. Distance cannot hide us from God. And then he says, verse 10, even there your hand will guide me, your hand will hold me fast. There's a hand that guides you so you don't get lost and a hand that guides you so you don't fall down. You know, as a, you've got a little child and all of a sudden you can see that they're headed in the wrong direction and all of a sudden it's just grab their hand. And what do you do? You're not letting go even though they're squirming to high heaven to get out of your hand. You have that hand and you are holding fast and you are not letting go because you know where you're headed. And your heavenly Father, His right hand holds you fast. As much as you try to squirm out, He is holding you fast. This is the revelation that the psalmist had. Then he goes on and he says, Even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. Do you know 11% of adults have a phobia of the dark? Why? Good question. They feel more vulnerable in the dark. 
And God says, even the darkness will be light to you. You know, there was, I was reading kid stories this week. There's this little kid, and his mum says to him, um, you know, go into the pantry and get a can of tomatoes. He says, but I'm scared of the dark. He says, you don't, she says, you don't need to worry. Jesus is with you. The little boy thought. She's like, Jesus will be there. Jesus will be there. He's, he's freaking out, scared of the dark. So he goes to the pantry. He's standing outside the pantry, and he goes, Jesus, if you're there, can you pass the tomatoes? <laughs> but I think there is this thought that we don't fully understand that the darkness cannot hide us from God. Put it this way. I don't know if you've ever had a Christmas tree in your house or something that was really lit up. I don't until December, unlike some other people who have their tree up already, but that's okay. If you have your tree up, no judgment. I just think, anyway. If you have your tree (laughs) all lit up, I'm a one. It doesn't matter. If I have this tree all lit up, and all of a sudden it's in a dark room and I turn the lights on, the darkness becomes light. See that? When you walk into anywhere and you walk with God, He is light. And so wherever He is cannot stay dark, it becomes light. Come on, if you get this, it transforms everything. There does not need to be fear gripping over us about anything. Why? Because when you face the dark, when he rocks up, the dark becomes not, does not become night anymore. The dark becomes light. I don't know if you've been in a situation where you're with a little kid and they're freaking out at the dark, but you can see exactly what you're doing. You know what you're doing. You know what it's like. You don't feel that fear. And so how do you comfort them? I mean, if you're a bad parent, you go and hide and play, whoo, like, you know, and you freak them out. If you're a good parent, what do you do? You grab them by the hand and you say, you know what? I know, I know you feel that, but you don't have to fear because I'm with you and we're walking this together. And just the fact that you're together Just the fact that my father knows where he's going makes this kid go, wow, I can relax. God is all around. You know, the darkness in the scriptures signifies suffering or danger, times of terror. What if you have a God that is always there, that has you by the hand, and wherever he is, the darkness is as light? And what if you got a fresh revelation this morning that when I go to work tomorrow and I pass that boss I'm freaking out about, or when I start to shrink back, I can remember that he holds me by the right hand and he says, do not fear, I will help you. There is no refuge from him. There is only refuge in him. There is no refuge from him. There is only refuge in him. Some of us have walked through things where we needed to withdraw and we needed to hide away. I'm with you, I get it. And that's why Psalm 91 is so powerful. Because the Lord is not saying there aren't times where you wanna hide. He's just saying, I'm your hiding place. Instead of finding other places to hide, instead of looking at things that are going to do you harm, instead of hiding in offense and bitterness and hurt and rejection, instead of hiding in that, would you hide in me? He who dwells in the secret place, in the hiding place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, what? He is my refuge and my fortress in God. I'll trust Corrie Tam Boom, if you've never read her book, The Hiding Place, it's famous. She was in a, a concentration camp in World War II, and she says this. She says that oftentimes if you look, and um, when you have made God your hiding place, if, if it's dark, it's because you're resting in his shadow. He is so close to you that he is covering 
every part of you. Because God is ever-present and with me, there are three things you can know. Number one, you can know that you're not alone. If God is ever-present, if he is everywhere and everywhere with you, then you can know that I am not alone. Isaiah 43, 2 says this. I think we have it. Here you go. It says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. What was the promise? The promise was when you walk through the waters, and then he gave this one line that was the guarantee of the whole thing. I will be with you. You know, the boys in the fiery furnace It wasn't that they didn't have to walk through the fire. It was just that they would have a savior who knew how to withstand the heat. And that when he came into that situation, they would not be consumed. They would leave that fire not even smelling of smoke. Did they still have to walk through some stuff? Absolutely. Did they still have to face and stand up and do all the things they had to do? They did. And you and I have to too. These scriptures are not like magic medicines, you take a pill and all of a sudden all the flames go away. That is not what these scriptures say. But when you walk, it doesn't, I noticed, I think Pastor Warren said this last week, it doesn't say if you walk. It says when you walk. What's that? A bit of a guarantee. There will be things you walk through. There will be flames that will try and consume you. And when you do, he will be with you. The second thing you can know is you don't have to fear. Isaiah 41.10, one of my life verses. I think if, if you hear me pray, I'll probably somewhere quote it somewhere. I think we have it there. No. It says, when he take, the Lord takes you, takes a hold of your right hand and says, do not fear, I will help you. And even just a couple of weeks ago, as I was bringing my heart before the Lord and just feeling a little bit hopeless about some stuff. And it was literally like the Lord just reminded me, stop. Do not fear. I've got you. By the right hand, I'm telling you, you don't have to fear. I am with you. I will help you. I hope this is sinking in this morning. Where fear has gripped you, where you have isolated yourself, I'm all alone. You are only alone by choice. Because your heavenly father longs for you to draw near to him. He longs to be with you. He longs to guide you and to lead you. And then the third thing you can know, that if God is ever present, if God is all knowing, the third thing you know is you are accountable. I love what Jack Hayford says. He says that one of the primary primary discipline techniques that his mum used to use was Jesus is watching you. But in all honesty, what if we all thought that? Before we went to let our mouths run off or before we went to give someone a piece of our mind or before we went into fear or worry or whatever it is. Jesus is watching me. You know, the very one of the very first revelations in the scriptures is where Hagar is in the desert, and she gets a revelation. He is the God who sees me. And as a woman, she had that revelation for herself, that God saw her. What would happen if we all got a revelation that our Heavenly Father watches all we do, knows all about us, and loves us completely? I mean, insecurity... What's that? If, if we really have a true revelation that God is with us, if the musicians could come this morning. You know, God's presence with us is the basis of our security. Dallas Willard says this. He says, God's presence with us is the basis of our security, our mental health, our peace, our godly character, the fruit of the Spirit, 
God's presence is the basis for our anointing for service. If we know that God is with us, it should be the basis of everything. Well, Beck, that's nice. It's nice that you told me that God's with me. That's lovely. What's the, what's the problem? The problem is, is that we live like he's not. Come on, hear me. The problem is we can have mental assent and know that he's with us and still worry about our finances. The problem is we can know because we've beat around or you heard today's message or you're online, you came across something. You can hear the words, God is with me. Okay, let's take us out of the picture. When Jesus arrived on the scene as God with us, Emmanuel, the majority of the people missed it. Didn't they? Only a handful would recognize that he was the Messiah and that he'd come to save the people from their sins. I don't want to miss him anywhere, anytime. And you don't have to miss him. You guys can come up. You know, when um, I'm ending with this, when in the number six blessing, it says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. It literally means may the Lord look right at you. That's if you translate it in the Hebrew. May the Lord look right at you. And this is the picture. Picture a playground. And you take a kid, or you take your kids or grandkids or someone you know, you take them to the playground. And you know, playgrounds aren't what they used to be. And so you go, and what do you do? You have a watchful eye. You go, and who do you have eyes for? Well, hopefully you're thinking about everyone, but probably, hopefully, you've got eyes at the one that you're responsible for. So your gaze is looking right at your child on the playground. And that's the picture here, that your heavenly father, he is looking over you. What happens if all of a sudden that two-year-old gets too close to the edge? All of a sudden, you're in there. Oh, and then you stop just when they look like they understand it's not safe. You kind of stop going, yeah, that's, that's good, that's good. And you, you're a little bit closer now, but at least they know, like, they're not going to jump off that height because they, they're not able to yet. And then it looks like, and you're in there, your heavenly Father looks after you like that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance. May He look right at you and give you peace. For the literalists among us, but I can't see Him back. Well, Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. And this is what it says of Moses that Moses saw God who was invisible. Listen, Moses saw God who was invisible. Um, Writer to the Hebrews, do you know what you're talking about? How can you see a God who is invisible? That's what Moses did. He saw God who was invisible. And so I wanna encourage you that when you walk out and go for your daily walk and you're looking at the trees, can you not see? God made those. When you meet someone, they hold the fingerprint of the one who made them. When you meet someone who loves Jesus and a fellow believer, the Holy Spirit indwells in them. And so even as I even as I talk to any of you that the Spirit of God is in you. Well, and knowing that we're human and sometimes it's not all God unfiltered that comes out of us. But knowing that as we can commune and talk, when we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, that there might just be something that you say, that I know, that I know, that I know, that was Jesus talking to me. The Lord looks right at you.
Would you stand this morning? Dallas Willard, that's a great message on where is God, who is God, that if you were going to go and, he's a Baptist theologian, if you want to go and um, listen to more of that, you, I would recommend that for sure. But he makes this beautiful point at the end of, I think it's a, a lecture actually, not a sermon. And he says, the only way that really that we can be aware that God is with us is if we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And Pastor Warren even said it this morning. When your mind is hooked on everything else, it will not be solid and stable in Jesus. There's a famous artist. I think Rosie has a kind of clip. This kind of artwork is called reverse perspective. And it's like a 3D artwork. It's famous. But if you look, the objects that actually are far away are actually close. You look as you look 3D and you turn it, it's a 3D artwork where the distance of the object is misleading because actually the picture is and the image is close. That was the picture I had for us this morning. That just when you think God is distant, take another look. He's closer than you think. He's nearer than you know. We're going to do something different with communion. We're going to end rejoicing with this song, Where Can I Go? I hope that this is like in your spirit as you leave this service and all through the week. Thanks. But I want to give you opportunity to come and get communion from out here this morning. And then just by yourself, thank Him for being near. I thank Him for lots of things. I don't know how often I just Thank you for being close. And I want you to have just a little moment with Jesus by yourself this morning. They're going to start to sing. They're not going to sing something soft and moody and not ending like that this morning. They're going to end rejoicing with just singing the psalm over us. And I want as you present your hearts before Jesus, thanking Him for the cross, thanking Him that the very the very thing that we're remembering this morning is what brings us near to Him. There are no blockages that can separate us from the love of God because of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You that even as we come and we take this communion this morning, that we are being reminded of Your love for us, that there is nothing that can separate us. There's nowhere we can go, nowhere we can hide. And some of us need to bring our hearts before you in repentance because you've seen what we've said. You've seen where we've gone and you know it's not our best life. And we need to bring our hearts before you and ask afresh for your cleansing. And we thank you that your word says that we that you are faithful and just, that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we don't have to walk in condemnation, but we can go, oh, my heavenly Father sees me. And with that revelation all week long will keep us close to your heart, listening for your voice. We thank you for your presence this morning. Oh, God, thank you that you're here. Thank you that your word says we're two or more gathered. There you are. I thank you that even as we leave this building today, that we leave knowing God is with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you come down? Come and get your communion this morning.
keep playing that instrumentally. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. God is looking right at you. And may he give you peace. Bless you, church.